The White Pill is available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon. Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. I am thrilled to have Matt Lewis on the show. Matt works for the Daily Beast and his new book is out this week. I want to get the subtitle exactly right. Filthy rich politicians, the swamp creatures, latte liberals and ruling class elites cashing in on America. Matt, uh, I've been on your show, I think a couple of times. I am really, you, even though you work for the Daily Beast, I can tell you that um, when you and your colleagues are put up against the wall, you, you'll be the last one. I, I'll, I can't stop it from happening, but I can at <laughs> least keep you at the very end. Um, I'm, congratulations on your second book. This is such a big accomplishment. It's harder and harder people to get book deals nowadays, and I know it couldn't have been easy. Uh, what I want to do, uh, can you talk about how you got the idea for the book? And this is something just maybe a little too much inside baseball. What, how did it change from the concept to the finished product? Yeah. Uh, so I got the idea, honestly, because an agent approached me and said, I have an idea for a book that will sell. And it's the 100 richest politicians in America. Well, I have to interrupt you because, because you literally just said the perfect thing. When people ask me for book advice, the one sentence I tell them is write the book you can sell not the book that you yes. want to write. So that agent is a very, very smart person, whoever it is. Is the guy from, is it Keith? No, I'm no okay. longer with Keith. I love Keith, but no okay. longer my agent. His name's Frank. Um, and the original idea, the, the idea he pitched me was sort of, I don't know if you remember, Bernie Goldberg had a book about 20 years ago that was like the 100 worst people in the world yes, in yes. America, you know? And so the idea was the 100 richest politicians in America, each each rich politician would be a chapter and a short chapter, and it would be, um, you know, not really a deep book, kind of more yeah. like uh, salacious or something. Yeah, yeah. That's the original idea. And I, uh, I, I liked it because I thought, well, I don't know too much about this topic, but it seems bite sized. Like, I feel like I could I could do this. I could do like a page or two on each politician and I'll learn some stuff along the way. And that's the book we sold. And I'm so thankful, though, that, as you've implied, it did evolve. Yeah. And the interesting thing is. You would think that a publisher, the, I think the stereotype is that you will have a beautiful, creative, artistic idea, and then the publisher will dumb it down and oh, make, yeah, it, make it sell. In this case, we pitched a book that we thought would sell, and the publisher was like, we like it. We want more substance, and <laughs> we want it to be more, more meaningful and deeper, and that's what it evolved into ultimately. But I think that's a good idea because a book that a book is obviously not a website. It would have been dated by the time it hit the streets because that hundred number, you know, if it, you're dropping it in January, it's coming out in let's say October. By October, you know, there's another Trump or Vivek or Ramaswamy is a good example. Like you, probably by the time you put the book in, he he was nobody, and then he's out there. He's he's arguing that he's worth more than Trump, or he's certainly worth more than you and, and everyone we know put together, probably. Um, uh, this is something that I think is a really key point that you make, um, and I want to get into it more in the context of the book. There's a lot of people in conservatism who believe that like all these Democrats, like Democratic officials are communists when they're clearly like corporate hacks uh, who are delighted to have corporations uh, do well on the stock market because they're the ones profiting from it. And this idea that like they're, they want to usher in Stalinism when they know they just they have no principles at all other than push, you know, setting yeah. up the playing field to further the companies that play ball with them and, you know, pocket a ton of money um, in the process. Can you talk a bit more about what you learned in the process of writing this book? Yeah, I think that um, it really, uh, it's a bipartisan phenomenon, uh, but Democrats do lead the league in some of the categories. Yeah. <laughs> For example, um, insider trading, or at least what the appearance of insider trading 
of congressional insider trading. I mean, I, I don't have to tell you this, Michael, but Nancy Pelosi, and in fact, her husband, Paul Pelosi's trades are probably the most egregious, the most, the ones that look the swampiest, right? And so I could go through those, uh, the, the, the ones that Please I think do. are real. Let's, let's go through them. We have okay. This is <laughs> so there are, two, there are two Pelosi trades that I think really stand out. One of them is in 2020, Paul Pelosi uh, bought hundreds of thousands of dollars of stock options in Tesla. Five weeks later, Joe Biden signs an executive order mandating the transition of fleets for federal, state, and local you know, fleets to zero emissions vehicles. So you can imagine what happened to uh, the stock options uh, of Tesla. They went through the roof. Uh, and again, five weeks between when, when uh, Paul Pelosi buys those stock options and when Joe Biden signs that executive order. Less than a year later, so that's the first example. And, and also um, hundreds of thousands of shares of options, excuse me, is not pocket change. It's not like he's like, oh, let me just play some roulette, throw some cash at this. This is a massive investment of funds, no matter how much money you have. Massive. We're talking, you know, millions, definitely millions of dollars here. The second example happens in 2021, where Pelosi exercises options to buy, I think it was uh, $10 million worth of Microsoft shares. And in this case, it was like two weeks later, the army announces that they are buying, that, that they, are, they are using Microsoft to create these augmented reality headsets. This could be worth billions of dollars, right? Yeah. And we're talking about Paul Pelosi makes these bets within weeks. In one case, Joe Biden signs an executive order. And the other example, the army announces that they're going to go with Microsoft for these augmented reality headsets. Now look, could it be a coincidence? I guess, but there are a lot, <laughs> the Pelosi's get lucky on a lot of bets. And and the other thing is, this isn't like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm getting news that something's coming down the pike in East Asia, so I'm going to invest in an East Asian company because the market's looking that way. These are like, okay, these are orders. Like, this is like cash in hand, certain things that are going to benefit the company. There's no really risk involved because the government places, places an order for something that is going to be filling the coffers of the respective companies. Um, what... I mean, so break this down a, a little bit more. I mean, do you think this is something that is a recent phenomenon? Um, I think that there's ob obviously always been corruption taking place in politics, and it's looked different at different times, right? So, for example, um, I think it was Armin Hammer who hired Al Gore's father, uh, and basically you know, they were involved in things like cattle futures. And, <laughs> and so there's always been corruption. Um, in my opinion, what makes it very bad today is that since about the mid 80s, the gap between average Americans and our politicians has widened dramatically. So right now, the average politician is like 12 times richer than the average American household. And so, and th by the way, this when I say politician, this isn't the president. People expect okay. a president to be rich, or this isn't even the US Senate. This is your house member. Your average member of the house today is a millionaire. And the average member of the house, the lower chamber is 12 times richer than the average American household. And so I think what has happened is that the corruption feels way worse because there is a sense that the game is rigged. There is a sense that politicians are, you know, feathering their nests, using their perch to feather their nest. And it's not just an impression, it's happening. It really is happening. And so I think corruption has always been around. It's always been a problem. Politicians have always found ways to cash in. Right. But because of the disparity between elected officials and normal Americans like you and me, uh, I think that it feels a lot worse. I've never been called normal before. Um, let, let me, let, but let me like push back a little bit on this. Could this be a chicken and egg situation in that 
it's become so much more difficult to become an elected official because you have to buy commercials, you have to, you know, social media, you know, the, the um, barriers to entry are, are quite high as opposed to back in the day, if you're a good party man, you know, like Warren Harding is a great example of this. Like, they're like, okay, we need, just need some asshole to be the nominee. Warren's not going to cause us any problems. You know, this is 1920. And, and I, I think someone at the time just said, Warren's job just has to be to go home and shut the F up. So he doesn't screw things up. And he had like the biggest landslide in history up until that moment. Uh, it's, I think it's just, it's, I, I'm sure you agree. It's almost impossible despite the AOC kind of fairy tale for someone who's like a bartender, or maybe there was that guy in, in uh, the trucker in New Jersey who beat the, beat the Senate majority, uh, New Jersey uh, state Senate majority leader. If you're an average American, how are you even going to get on the ballot? How are you going to get the signatures? How are you going to get the party to support you? You're going to need in many ways to kind of pay your own way to even have your foot in the door. And also you're gonna have to have all that money because the vitriol is so extreme that at the very least, if your career's ruined, which like if someone's working for Trump at this point, like it's not gonna bode yeah. well for the, look at all these You're lawyers, gonna have a lot of know? legal expenses. Right, probably. it's just like, why am I putting myself through this nonsense? No, I totally agree. And so my book is about, we've been talking about half of my book. My book is about how the rich get elected and the elected get rich. Yeah. And I think the latter part of that the, the second half of the equation is, is is more concerning, right? It's more concerning to me that people who get elected get richer um, because that is just more, I think, more corrosive. Um, but I think the first part of the book is is important too, that rich people tend to get elected. And I don't think that's inherently evil or bad, um, but I do think that it raises some issues and some concerns. And I would say, speaking a true story about myself, um, you know, my wife is a Republican political fundraiser. That's what she does for a living. She's really good at her job. And I've been, you know, in politics for like 15 or 20 years. And I live in West Virginia now where we have like an open house seat, an open governor seat, an open Senate seat. Look at this. And look what I just got, look what I just got in the mail last week. Do you see what that is? Is that John Brown? It's a piece of his hair, a piece of his coat and a piece of the rope used to hang him. Wow. I got to get that framed for my Hall of Heroes. We are si I am sitting literally right between where John Brown was captured in Harper's Ferry and That's where awesome. he was hanged in downtown Charlestown, West Virginia. Yeah, if, And if people don't know about John Brown, you should really look him up. He's an extremely interesting American figure. I totally agree. I'm fascinated by it. And I have this talk. I have two sons, a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. And I try to introduce them to gray areas of yeah. life and, and critical thinking. And we discuss every once in a while whether John Brown's a hero or a terrorist or both. Right. <laughs> or, or, or was he like a, a high principled or was he a lunatic? Like there's that yeah. argument that he's like literally a crazy person. And uh, he, so did kill, he killed innocent people in Kansas, right. by the way, that a lot of people don't don't think of. But um, anyway. You're talking about your wife in the I'm fundraising. I'm in West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. And so we were going for a walk, you know, maybe six months ago or, you know, a year ago or something. And I was saying to her something like, um, well, it's kind of too bad that there's this current political era because I could never I could never win election in this political era yeah. in West Virginia. Uh, they'd call me a they, they would think I'm a rhino or something, um, you know, even though I'm kind of to the right of Attila the Hun in many ways. But they but I, but it wouldn't work. And she was like, well, you couldn't run anyway. I mean, you, you, you wouldn't have the money. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? You're a fundraiser. I've got friends and contacts. And she's like, no. She's like, let me tell you what I tell people who call me. If you can't either self-fund yep. or raise a minimum of $300,000 in the first month or two before we reach out to packs or donors. If you can't do that before, then don't even bother calling me basically. And I'm like, based on that criteria, I could not run yeah. for the lower house in America today. But here, let me, let's, let's, let's suss this out because I'm not a fan of democracy. Uh, as ridiculous as aristocracy is the idea that like Prince Harry, cause he was born into this family should have any kind of say over his, my life. If I was a British person is kind of crazy, but it's also even crazier to me that my rando neighbors should have an opinion about how I live in my, live my life, raise my family, spend my time as long as I'm not hurting anybody. Um, I think that it's useful to have some heuristic 
for having successful people be the ones making decisions as opposed to less successful people. One of the things that drives me crazy in social media, and I, I'm confident you would agree to some extent, is that these people who are complete like basket cases still, still feel confident going on social media and passing judgment and telling other people how they should live their lives. It's like, get your house in order first before you run in your mouths. So couldn't you see this as perhaps being a useful mechanism to weed out people who, for lack of better terms, are losers, uh, to sound like the former president, but to make sure that it's people who've actually managed to do something other than, I suppose, heirs, uh, to have, be in a position to make those decisions? Yeah, so I guess what I say in the book is, that I don't care if rich people run and get elected. In fact, in a way I can admire it, right? Because I feel like if I were super rich, I would be getting drunk on a beach with models right now. Like, I don't think my, I don't think I would want to give back and like be, you know, go to Congress. And I, I wish I would, but just being honest, but I'm why not put sure. your, And why put your wife through that in all seriousness? Like, <laughs> well, no, if you're rich, like my wife is super hot and she would, you know. No, but uh, she's going to get attacked on social media. She's going to be denigrated. They went after Casey DeSantis for having cancer. That's what I mean. Like, if you're running for office, you're putting her in the line of fire. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, or my kids, too, for that Yeah, matter, exactly. Right? Yeah. Maybe even, my, maybe even my grandchildren that don't exist if I don't accept them. Right. Uh, like, Hunter, like Hunter Biden. Um, yeah, no. I mean, why would any normal sane person want to be elected, right? right? I mean, the idea that you're going to be glamorous, like, this is going to be Camelot, like, or, you know, JFK or something, if that ever existed, it hasn't existed for a long, long time. So well, you know how we know how, well, we know how that Camelot story yeah. ends. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd rather have the happy ending than the happy beginning. <laughs> Fair point. It didn't last long. Yeah. Um, so this is a like a long wind up to say, like, in a way, I admire rich people who don't just go on a yacht somewhere. They they actually want to give back. Um, I think there are some potential problems. I think that there's the um, the transitive power of expertise. People who become very successful in one yep. industry or in a business assume they know what they're doing. Right. And honestly, a lot of times they don't. Like just nope. because you were successful in this business doesn't mean you're going to be good Correct. in politics. Um so that's that's one of the issues. Yeah, every actor wants to be a director. That's not totally. how it works. Yeah. Everybody wants to do what they're not doing. Yeah. Um, I think some of it's a little bit of boredom, right? I think it's the same reason that rich people buy rocket rides and baseball teams. They they want they want the excitement. I'm not sure yeah. that's the best motive. Um, so I do think there are some potential downsides regarding motives of why rich people want to run. Um, at the end of the day, it's sort of like the old, you know, conservative line, like uh, a poor person's never given me a job. Yeah, you know, right. I think there is something to be said for people who have been successful in some sphere of life, who want to give back, and and that's that's totally cool. I do think again, though, um, when we are now at a point where the average, you know, Madison thought that that the lower house, just you know, I've been calling it the people's house, but I don't think anyone else has ever called it that other than me. Right. I think that's what people call the White House, but but the house. You know, the House of Commons is what, you know, essentially what it is, Just that Madison wanted that to be people who uh, politicians who had um, a sympathy with normal average Americans and, in fact, were tied to them. You know, that's why every two years they get reelected. Yeah. And I think the, the real problem is that it's not that presidents have gotten out of touch or whatever. I, I think it's that. At your average congressman now is 12 times richer than the average American. And the other problem, too, and this I don't even talk about this in my book, but I believe we should uncap the House. Like right now, there are 435 yeah. members of Congress. There should be like yeah. five times that many. Yeah. And that would solve a lot of these problems, including some of the money problems, I think. Yeah, I think you're absolutely. I think that's a great, great point because I don't know when they hit 435. I think it was like the 1920s or, or something like that. It's been a, it's been a minute, and yep. the American population has absolutely exploded since then. And then you know, lefties make this point that it's ridiculous that like you know, Rhode Island has two Senate seats, and and California you know has uh, um, two Senate seats as well, which is that that's a criticism. I think it's absurd, but they will point out that you'll have that one House member in like you know New Hampshire is corresponding to far more. It's not doesn't it doesn't the math doesn't play out 
because the smallest states are going to have that one house member that's going to ha have a different percentage of the population. Yeah. And, and, um, and think so of I think what that does. Like, A, if you're a citizen and you want to reach out to your congressman, yeah. it's a lot harder to get his or her attention. And then B, if you're that congressman, you think you're, you know, you're an elitist now. You're the man, you know. And so I think it has a lot of detrimental effects on our politics. And and we can see this, you know, I'm always knock people who have this idea that, oh, we need a third party because you look at Europe where the parliaments have, you know, nine or 10 parties. But at the same time, like in, I think it's the Swedish uh, parliament, there's a party just for animal rights uh, in like Norway, I think it is. There's a party just for people who are pensioners. So when you have these smaller voting blocks represented in parliament or in this case congress it'll be a lot easier for smaller populations i don't mean like like uh like minorities like african americans necessarily but people who are like okay like we are you know five percent the population here but if it's five percent of a million versus five percent of ten thousand we can really kind of push above punch above our weight and have our voices heard so i think that's a really smart um and feasible a uh, uh, way to kind of, and, and there, there's supposed to be, and I hate using that expression because the blue pill expression, a big disparity between Senate and the House. Like the senators are this kind of, our kind of equivalent of aristocracy. Whereas like you said, the House is yep. for like low lives. It's just for some, no, but it, the idea it was really like, is, yeah. I'm just some random asshole, but I got enough of the rabble to have my back. And now I'm going to go in there and like John Randolph of Roanoke was just an example of this. He was one of the early congressmen and he would just come into that house floor with his dogs and be like, you guys are all idiots and go back home. But like, <laughs> and that's why you had things like people being the shit out of each other on the house. Well, actually that might've been the Senate, but the point is there was, it was much more of this Jacksonian sense of um, democracy than it was this, as you put it, like Nancy Pelosi having nine figures as on her salary of what is it like one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year of that? Yeah, it's a hundred. Well, the average congressman makes one hundred and seventy four thousand a year, but Pelosi, be, because Pelosi was the speaker, she's made a lot more money at different points, or at least a little bit more money. But you know what, Michael? If you took her salary, she would have to work five hundred years to earn her current net wealth. And that tells you all you need to know about filthy rich politicians. That, that's how that's 500 years ago is when she was in college. That's that's kind of so <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe that's need, when her dad was mayor of Baltimore, right? Yeah, maybe, maybe you need to do the math on that, Lewis. Maybe, maybe your entire premise is wrong because your actuarial tables are just completely screwed <laughs> dealing with these undead demons. Folks, you know, putting together a good look that's also comfortable is sometimes a big pain in the you know what. And men's closets were due for radical reinvention, and Roan has stepped up to the challenge. Their commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man, and here's why. You never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan commuter collection because they have a comfortable four-way stretch fabric, which provides breathability and flexibility. So you can enjoy whatever life throws your way from your commute to work to your 18 holes of golf. You can feel confident without the hassle because Roan's wrinkle release technology means that wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. With Roan's Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. On top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can forget about the dry cleaning. They sent me a bunch. The stuff is really functional and goes well with pretty much any outfit. The commuter collection can get you through any work day and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash malice. Use promo code malice to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your order when you head to rhone.com slash malice and use code malice. It's time to find your corner office comfort. Upgrade your closet with Roan and use malice to save 20% at roan.com slash malice. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. There's a documentary that came out that I actually watched and I tweeted about and I'm happy to endorse because I think you'll learn a lot from watching it. It's something that dovetails a lot with the work that I've done in the past. You probably don't know the story of Pruitt Igo. It was a St. Louis housing project from the 1950s. It was built with federal money and the bureaucrats were convinced they could design the building so brilliantly it would improve the lives of everyone living there. And what happened? All the design features had the opposite effect. The things experts think will create community created criminals. It's a fascinating story of government hubris, which is the bad kind of hubris, unlike me, which is the good kind of hubris. So it's part of this documentary called Trust Us, 
which is about government ceding control to unelected experts who think they can design a better society. And Trust Us starts in the early 20th century and goes straight through the COVID pandemic. And we all know what they did during the COVID pandemic. I had a tweet not that long ago when I say experts agree is just code for government propaganda. So go to YouTube, look up the term Trust Us by Pacific Legal. And if you think the government experts are arrogant, you think they've got unchecked power, this shows not only is it much worse than you think, that this is not new. This has been going on for a century because this was an essential element of progressivism and this idea that people who are technically sophisticated and smarter than the rest of us can micromanage and macromanage an economy for the benefit of all. And this cuts across both parties, by the way. So go to youtube.com, check out Trust Us from the Pacific Legal Foundation. I watched it. I endorsed it. I'm really glad they're here to support the show. Let's get back to it. Let me ask this other question, though. Uh, um, one of my favorite stories in American history, uh, you know, the founding fathers are often, I think, kind of Disneyfied um, and regarded as this hive mind. Whereas, you know, anyone who's got like even a very visceral knowledge of American history knows that they often hate each other. Their disagreements were very intense. They are big personalities. It was much closer to Greek mythology. We had these like very flawed figures uh, as opposed to this kind of rarefied uh, uh, sense of American aristocracy. And I was specifically thinking of this moment that w was in Thomas Jefferson's, it's, it's, it's pronounced anus, A-N-A-S. It's his a uh, series of like like miscellaneous miscellaneous writings and the fact that it's called this is just absolutely hilarious to me. And according to Jefferson, he recounts a meeting, and this almost sounds like an Aesop's fable, but it's from his pen. It's him, John Adams, who later became the second president and was for America's first vice president, and Alexander Hamilton. And Jefferson, who kind of like John Brown, uh, was a little too bloodthirsty for many people's tastes. Understandably, he was saying that the French Constitution is the best constitution in the world. And Adams says, no, the British Constitution is the best of the world, uh, other than the corruption. And Hamilton says the British Constitution was the best in the world because of the corruption. And Jefferson, in this case, being this kind of naive liberal, just kind of doesn't even understand what Hamilton's talking about, just shakes his head, walks away, and he's like, can you believe that like freak that he thinks this? But I think Hamilton's point is if you don't if you, you, corruption in politics is inevitable right? You're going to have people looking out for the best interest. They're going to have incentives and so on and so forth. So unless you have a system that accommodates this and kind of uh, diverts that river into, uh, for lack of a better term, a socially useful uh, uh, context, the whole thing is going to tumble down and it's going to be really like Marie Antoinette where it's yeah. us versus them. So what do you think of that kind of argument that corruption is actually have some, uh, is both inevitable and in a sense beneficial uh, in our politics? So the way I view it is, first, as a conservative, what you just said obviously reminds me of Adam Smith and the invisible yes, hand, yes. right? And so, you know, utopians believe that they can have this perfect world and fix all the problems. And Adam Smith said, like, no, but let's make the problems work for us, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. Let's, let's greed, greed is bad. I don't think he thought greed was good, but but... Uh, it's bad, but it exists and it's not going away. So let's find a way to help invent the cure for cancer by using it, right? Yeah. That I think is genius. And that I think is along the lines of, of what uh, the founders uh, believed. I would also say as a Christian, as a very flawed one, but as a Christian, we don't believe in, you know, uh, a perfect world here either. You know, we, we we have a fallen world. And I think that's a key difference philosophically in terms of worldview is that there are certain people who believe in the perfectibility of man. And I do not. I believe that uh, things are going to be bad. People are always going to steal. People who have power are always going to try to exploit it. And if you think you can get rid of it or fix the problem, uh, you are wrong. And probably you'll make it things worse by, by virtue of unintended consequences. Oh, yes. Um, but I, what I think we do need to do is try to have reforms that can mitigate the problem, um, because, again, I think if if right now there is a sense that the game is rigged, and um, and it's not it's not a bogus sense. Like uh, people are picking up on the fact that the game is rigged. What is it like? Ninety eight percent of Congress people are real. It's some crazy number. That's the weird thing, right? That like. Even though trust in Congress is like at an all time low, it's lower than 
anything. It's like lower. It's it's lower than like abortionists. It's lower than yeah. like you name you name the institution or the industry. And trust in politicians is like lower than that. And yet people will keep reelecting their member of Congress. So it's a little bit schizophrenic in that regard. And I'm and I don't understand actually why um, why that happens. Um, but right now, people do not trust politics. They don't trust elites. They do not trust uh, our, our political leadership. And um, some of that's healthy. I mean, I think a little bit of distrust is actually healthy. Um, it'll keep them in check. Like it, it's it's bad if you love and salute the president and think he's you know beyond reproach. But I do think there's a tipping point where if people don't trust the system at all, the wheels come off. And um, that's why I, I'm in favor of reforming it, including things like banning stock trading. That's one of my one of the things I would do. I'm also now for term limits, Michael. This is something where I've changed. I used to be completely against term limits. This is one issue that I've changed my mind on. Well, let, let's talk. Well, first of all, I think you and I disagree because I want the wheels to come off. So I'm, <laughs> I know I'm, you I'm, do. <laughs> I'm very heartened to hear that it's working. Um, uh, the term limits thing is something that I think it, 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 it makes more sense on paper, That, but now we have enough data that, in my opinion, it doesn't really work. And th something that's near and dear to me is New York City. And New York City implemented term limits. You had really Giuliani for two terms, was limited out. Then you had M M Mike Bloomberg, who had two. Then he cut a deal with the city council. They just basically ignored the, the law. He got a third term. He was term limited out. And you had uh, almost literal communist uh, Bill de Blasio becoming mayor. And I'm going to tell one Bill de Blasio story, which I absolutely love, which I'm sure you will love just in a, in a way that's like, okay, this guy, this is just so effed up that I can appreciate it. So, you know, de Blasio is, was building homeless shelters around New York City. Um, and, you know, this is a big concern for anyone because no one wants to live near a homeless shelter. It's bad for the real estate, crime rates. You know, you, want, you don't want walking your kid to school and some you know, crazy person is flinging feces at them, so on and so forth. So de Blasio, in the commie idea of fairness, uh, the the southern, the street across the south of Central Park, uh, Central Park is known as Billionaire's Row because it's the most expensive real estate in the world or in America. It's, it's exorbitant. So he's like, you know what? We should have equality. He's putting a homeless, he put a homeless shelter there or was going to. The idea being, well, we should all have to deal with this nonsense equally even though if he, that had just been like a building, it would be like possibly billion dollars in tax revenue that could fight the homeless problem. But yeah, no, in the just name of give equality, it to homeless people. Right. Oh yeah, literally you could buy them all houses. <laughs> just give them a nice little studio apartment somewhere in Rockway Beach. But no, 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 we're gonna have equality. So we're gonna have a homeless shelter right on Billionaire's Row so that when the, the Secretary General of the UN or whatever is walking by, he has to deal with the crazy person flinging feces. But point in, in all seriousness, though, what he did and now his successor, Eric Adams, did is doing to New York, uh, did something that I did not think was conceivable in my lifetime. They destroyed this vibrant city. There's no mechanisms for turning it around. Uh, I assure you that I left New York kicking and screaming and literally crying. Um, and it, it was very, very rough. So I and I'm not seeing any real evidence that how would term limits address the issue that you are facing? Well, so, I mean, in the case of New York, um, I think Giuliani was by far the best mayor uh, and really cleaned it up. I'm not sure if that would have been sustainable. I don't know what a third or fourth Rudy that's, Giuliani that's, term might have looked a, like. That's a fair point. Yeah. Um, but but in terms of, of, of filthy rich politicians, um, so first I've my whole life, I've pretty much been against term limits. And it's I think it started because, you know, Ronald Reagan actually um, wanted to get rid of presidential term limits, not not for himself. He, he was not trying to uh, apply this to himself, but for future presidents. And his argument was like, look, we already have term limits. They're called elections. They happen every two years. And the American public should have a right to vote for the person that they want. I mean, Reagan had been an FDR fan. Yes. That was his boyhood hero. So it makes a little sense that he would be for, you know, letting someone serve multiple terms. Um, I also feared that what would happen is if you impose term limits, you would end up having 
a kind of a, a permanent bureaucracy arise yep. of, of, of lobbyists and staffers who become the real experts while these yokel congressmen are cycled in and out all the time. Um, so for a long time, that was my position. Uh, once I started really delving into this book, researching it and writing it, I kind of had a change of heart. And I mean, obviously, I, I think term limits shouldn't be like two years or anything like that. It should be more like five terms for a member of Congress, two terms for a senator, two terms as we have currently now for a president. So it's nothing like radical, but but um, I think if nothing else, it would it would help mitigate the problem of people cashing in on their job. Yeah. Someone okay. like, um, no. like Nancy Pelosi, who has now had like generate accumulated generational wealth, that wouldn't happen uh, if, if over the course of, say, five or 10 years, it's been allowed to happen over the course of 20 or 25 years. Yeah. And you actually make a good point, because what people don't talk about you know, publicly is lobbying. And you have the Rolodex to, I guess we're both dating ourselves. You, uh, you have that list of names who will take your call and you're paid exorbitant amounts of money because now you, I'm Nancy Pelosi, I'm retiring from the house. I know I could get anyone on the phone, probably including Donald Trump if push came to shove. And I could be like, hey, you're pushing for this bill, you know, and I'm going to give the argument for, you know, whatever company I'm working for. This is really going to, and that face to face being able to get him on the phone is worth enormous amounts of Big money. Time. And if you're there for this kind of institution, like a Mitch McConnell, like a Nancy Pelosi, if you're sticking around while everyone's kind of going through that revolving door, you're going to have a disproportionate amount of access. And that amount of access is going to be extremely financially lucrative and is almost the epitome of corruption. Um, yep. Whereas if you're like you're saying, if you're there for 12 years, it's really going to be far. Not only is it going to be mitigated, the people you're going to be trying to call, they're going to be out of the House or, or the Senate as well. I'm reminded specifically, and, and I'm sure you're going to find this, you remember this, and it's a humor example, humorous example, when Microsoft hired Bob Dole uh, to lobby because uh, the, the, basically the argument, no, no, it was anti-Microsoft because the argument was Microsoft is including Internet Explorer for free with their computers. And yep. if you control their web browser, you're going to control access to the Internet. And this is a monopoly. And how dare you? And it's like the idea that Bob Dole, who even at the time was deceased, uh, has some kind of understanding of the Internet. Uh, and is in a position to speak on this was ludicrous on its face. But listen, he got his cut of the money and he went and you knew he worked those phones and every single person took that call, including Democrats, because Bob Dole had been in Congress, I think, since the 60s. Yeah, no, it, it's it's uh, I think it's about between a quarter and a third of the members of Congress will go on to be lobbyists. And these yeah. are official lobbyists. A lot of right. them are lobbying, but they're not registered as lobbyists. They're adv strategic advisors. And in a right. way, being a strategic advisor is even better because you can still go to the house gym yeah. and like play basketball with members without lobbying them. But it's something like a quarter to a third of Congress men and women who retire go on to be lobbyists. And um, they really do cash in. Um, and other people, even if they don't become lobbyists, they uh, start a foundation or they just basically can keep giving out money from their campaign. They, they don't, you know, when they retire, they retire with millions of dollars in their campaign accounts. They can keep giving that money out. And by the way, while I'm going to a fundraiser to give that out, I could stay at the Four Seasons with yeah. my money because I'm on official business. I mean, it's, it's a complete, it's a lifestyle that yes. they've become accustomed to, and it doesn't end when they leave Congress. And it, again, there's no way to fix the problem. In my book, Filthy Rich Politicians, I propose a 10, a 10 year moratorium on lobbying. Um, some people like AOC and Ted Cruz, believe it or not, want lifetime bans on lobbying. Um, I'm not sure that would hold up a constitutional test. Right now in the House, I believe it's two years and in the Senate, it's one or something. It's one or two years um, and, and the chambers are slightly different uh, that you have to sort of take a break after you leave from lobbying. I think we should go a few more years. And again, it's not gonna fix the problem, but it might mitigate it a little bit. 
Yeah, I'm just curious how this goes in the face of the First Amendment, because if I'm paying Matt Lewis like a million dollars and I'm like, Matt, you know, and I would be hiring you for issues that you would probably agree with, you know, so it's not even like total corruption. It's like, hey, maybe you're passionate about term limits, right? So you, you wrote a book, you're advocating for term limits. I'm a term limits organization. Your wife's a fundraiser. You've got the Rolodex. Hey, let me get you on my board. I'm going to give you a sweet salary. And now you reach out to everyone you wrote an article about and just and and that kind of makes sense to you know uh, for everybody yeah i don't know if it would hold up in a supreme court challenge for example um i i think that uh, sort of and just in terms of common sense i think that if you've been a u.s senator uh that you should not go straight into lobbying your your former colleagues and, and tapping that rolodex like, i think that's that's wrong. It seems wrong. It seems corrupt. It seems swampy. Um, I would like to impose rules to stop it. If someone challenged that, I'm not sure that it would hold up, actually, though, uh, in the Supreme Court, because as you note, I mean, where, where does it say in the Constitution that you can prohibit someone from speak, speech or lobbying? Right, yeah. So, so um, yeah, it may not actually hold up. Uh, It'd be an interesting challenge but i also it's it's it, it's the term lobbying is something that to me seems like an objective term but when you try to break it down it really kind of collapsed like the word fair it's like what does that even mean it just means you like it right so if i'm a former senator and i'm i'm in the board of some 501c3 uh what does that mean? Like, I'm not allowed to, if, if the topic comes up when I'm hanging out with my former boys, I can't bring it up. Like, how does, do you know how these rules are actually implemented now? Like, what, what do they mean in practice? Well, as you've just described, it becomes, it's a gray area, right? Yeah. Because if you're hanging out with someone casually, um, is that different? And we, by the way, we see this with the insider trading stuff too, of course. like yes. pillow talk and all of that. Um, but uh, I can tell you there's something called the Daschle loophole, named after Tom Daschle, former uh, Senate, I think, majority leader Yes, at one point, where he he is now registered as a lobbyist. But for years, he worked as a lobbyist without being registered. And he actually had a lot of benefits. It was actually better for him, probably. Of course. And, and he didn't he wasn't tarred with that you know pejorative term yeah. lobbyist. Um, yeah, I'm not. But, hey, Matt, I'm not calling you as a lobbyist. I'm calling you as a concerned <laughs> friend. This is really bad for your reelection prospects, and I'm looking out for you, buddy. You should vote no on this bill. Oh, thank you so much, Senator. Yeah. And so he wasn't allowed to. He, he could talk to presidents and presidential uh, administrations. He could talk to people running, um, you know, these different alphabet soup, you know, organizations in Washington D.C. Um, what he couldn't do is, is talk about politics to elected current, like elected members of Congress. But again, what's talking, what's the, you know, you bump into someone that's a friend of yours and you're like, Hey, how's it going? Like, it's very difficult to police that, um, which is actually the same problem with insider trading yeah. uh, as well. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to police. And that's why with the insider trading, I, I want to ban We've already banned insider trading, which is like banning murder. You know, yeah, murder right. is already <laughs> illegal and yet it right. still happens. So what we need to do is is ban stock trade, individual stock trading, because then at least you have a chance to police it and you can draw some lines as to what's legal and what isn't. But it's also kind of funny in that, like, let's suppose you and I meet somewhere on runs each other restaurant 10 years down the road. Right. And it's like what we're what we're not going to talk politics. It's just like if you're an elected official and this is your lifeblood for 20 years and you run into, you know, your old colleague the, the, to have this kind of rule where like as if talking politics would be inorganic at that moment or only a function of corruption, as opposed to a lot of these people, as you know, firsthand as well, do not have any personality at all. They're entirely function, you know, they're soulless automatons. So of course they're going to be talking politics because they, there's nothing else for them really to uh, um, uh, discuss. So like you're saying, it, oh, God damn it. Can, it was Stephen, that was Stephen Kinsella, by the way. Uh, I'm going to put this. I'm, are you familiar with his work? He's a prominent libertarian. He's been on Tom's show all the time. Um, anyway. Oh, yeah. For those, for those listening, I'm a big uh, fan of the Tom Woods podcast. Oh, you're the guy. That's me. You're that, you're that one fan. <laughs> <laughs> 
Folks, did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? And if you wake up too hot or too cold, I recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. They're inspired by NASA. Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all day night long these fabrics were inspired by nasa they're thermoregulating they're designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long you get better sleep every night and because they're infused with silver that prevents up to 99.7 percent of bacterial growth they stay cleaner fresher three times longer than other sheets no more gross odors and they're very comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands they feel as nice if not nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels stop sleeping on bacteria clean sheets means less bacteria to clog your pores fewer breakouts, and other skin problems. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And if you're buying them for yourself as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use code malice at checkout, you get three free towels and save another 20%. Here's the kicker. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you don't like it, you get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice. Use code malice. Get your three-piece towel set for free and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash malice to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Hey, folks. Billionaire investor Ray DeLeo said increasing the debt limit means there's no meaningful limit on the debt and will eventually lead to a disastrous financial collapse. Bloomberg. Warning of a severe economic reset. Gold appears as a caged bull awaiting a catalyst. JP Morgan warned, cut stocks, buy gold, and hold your cash. And the Financial Times said investors are gaga for gold. Wells Fargo said gold is in a super cycle that could last another six years. Worst case scenario, $3,000 gold. So searches for how to buy gold on Google hit record levels in April. It's as simple as calling the Patriot Gold Group today to get yours. Find out why they are A-plus rated, Consumer Affairs top-rated gold and silver company nationwide. Call the proud Americans of Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late and mention my name. That's Michael Malice, and you'll always get best-in-class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the no-fee-for-life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the no-fee-for-life IRA on qualifying rollovers. All you have to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide or simply just go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row. So call 888-505-9845 or go to malicegold.com to protect your money. Let's get back to the show. So so that's kind of a – the other thing with the insider trading is I don't feel comfortable – and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Like if my spouse or my dad or my kid is in Congress to make it illegal for me to buy stocks and invest, and I'm not even being ironic here, almost seems fundamentally un-American because just because they're serving and they're in some office, what, I can't make money uh, where I see fit? That that seems kind of uh, crazy to me. Yeah. And I don't know how that's, and we, we have an individual rights system, not this kind of family. It, it, North Korean is the basis of society. How do you work around that? Well, I'd like to see it challenged. I think, I think once again, these are the ethical and constitutional conundrums. Yeah. Um, how do you tell some, like, here's a prime example. I mentioned earlier, my wife is a Republican political fundraiser. Um, I am a writer who, no, I'm an opinion writer, so it's a little different. I'm not, I'm, I've never been a straight reporter. I'm an opinion writer, but still I'm a writer in, in a mainstream outlet. My wife is a Republican fundraiser. Um, and what if, you know, she's worked for like Ken Cuccinelli and Tom and, and, and Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley. And I mean, you get on the list. I mean, yeah. I could I I can't stop writing about Ted Cruz and I've tried to like disclose it a million times but like have I have I disclosed every time I've written and like she worked for Ted Cruz she was his national fundraising consultant when he ran and won beat David Dewhurst in 2012 um and and then like it you know at some point it didn't work out I don't even remember what happened but like if I write something bad about him that could be construed as like revenge that she's not with him anymore. If I write something good about him, it could be construed as like favoritism, right? So like, but how about this? 
she and I don't really talk about it. And I'm just going to write what I believe because that's what I get paid to do. And it would be like insulting. My, my wife was a political fundraiser before we got married. It would be like insulting and ridiculous to expect her to quit doing what she's doing or for me to quit doing what I'm doing. And we try to, you know, have se separation and be ethical and disclose stuff. But like somebody could look at what we do and say like, well, that's a little shady or it should, maybe they shouldn't be doing it. And Michael, here's where I make the one distinction. I am not paid by the taxpayers. Yeah. And members of Congress are. And so my argument is, and by the way, this goes for Clarence Thomas and Jenny yeah. Thomas too. She should not be doing what she's doing. Um, not and, and just out of respect for the fact that not only is Clarence her husband, but he's one of only nine members on the Supreme Court making huge decisions. So even the appearance of impropriety creates major problems for him and erodes trust in the institution of the court. So yeah, it's great. I would say if someone wants me or my wife to quit, I'll tell them to go F themselves. Yeah. But if I was a member, if I'm elected by the American public or by my constituents and, and I'm paid by the taxpayers, all of a sudden now I think we have a little bit more of a right to have high expectations uh, for how they conduct themselves. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm also just thinking about the woman, Karen, uh, I, I'm, let me look up her exact name. Um, uh, Cause this, this was a really kind of an example that comes to mind. Um, her name was uh, Karen Taylor Robson. She oh, ran yeah. for the Arizona. Republican nom nominee for governor. She lost to Carrie Lake who later mm -hmm. lost the election. Carrie Lake's been on the show a couple of times and her husband's a billionaire. Right. And he obviously was funding her campaign. It's like, God, but it's kind of like if I'm a successful politician, uh, uh, a business person to the level where I'm a billionaire and now my wife, because I want to get her the F out of the house. She's in the governor's office. You can I don't even know what the cap what's the capital Tempe. I don't even know what the capital of Arizona is. Uh, you can F off to the governor's mansion. What I I have all this money that I invest in. I got to sit on my hands. That seems unreasonable as well. And also like if I'm running multiple companies with lots yeah. of people working for them and I'm really good at the, at the company to the sense that my company is expanding, these people have benefits, they have, they're paying for their, their families. I got to hand over my company to someone who doesn't have the institutional knowledge that I do. I've been in this company for decades and I got to bring yeah. someone in. I mean, these are actual, very concrete and immediate real problems if he was banned from doing something like this. Totally. It, it, it's so interesting and it becomes a incestuous and strange. Yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, <clears throat> I think his name is, is it Roy Blunt, former senator from yes. Missouri, just became a lobbyist. He's married to a lobbyist. And he's got three or four kids who are all lobbyists. And the problem is one of his kids used to be the governor of Missouri. So like, how do you tell right. an adult yeah. <laughs> who's a former governor, he can't be a lobbyist because his dad is a senator. You know what I mean? Like at some point you can't, it doesn't work. But I, I do believe um, that uh, it is not asking too much for a member of Congress, for them and their spouse and any dependent children who are you know living in their household sure. to not bet on the stock market. Now, if you want to have a mutual fund, go, you know, you can do that all day long. But in, but you don't have to be in Congress, eh? You don't have to be there forever. That's fair, yeah. And so during this time, I think I think it's it's re a reasonable ask. Okay, yeah, that's that's actually a good point. It's like no no one's putting a gun to your head. You, you get over yourself. It's not like if oh, if I'm not <laughs> the house, then the country's going to hell. So it, this is okay. And I, I also think something that's very useful in this regard, and I'm, I'm very pleased with how social media has uh, been a, a factor in this, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it, is transparency. Because I know that there's a Twitter account, they may have been banned, which was uh, called Pelosi, Pelosi st Stock Trade Ticker. And it, any trade that I think she or her husband did, it was tweeted about. So, you know, the corporate journalists, they did pick this up to some extent. So this is something that it's like, but the thing is, at the end of the day, it just seems like uh, America has become so tribal in many ways. Uh, you know, uh, Sam Harris got that comment that he didn't care if Hunter Biden, you know, killed someone in his basement, he'd still want Joe Biden in there. 
And frankly, that kind of like he got a lot of heat for it, but I can get what he was trying to say in an impolitic way. Yeah. If you have a, a president who's pure evil and is going to be, you know, d leading to destruction of the earth, as Harris's perspective, and his opponent killed one person, you got to, it's kind of like, you know, like your boy Winston Churchill, he's shaking Stalin's hand, um, you know, at Yalta because it's like he doesn't have good options. Yep. I think it was Ann Coulter who said that if Donald Trump was performing abortions at the White House, you know, she right, wouldn't yeah. care. I mean, uh, what is it? <laughs> One life. Maybe the best abortions. Everyone's praying and perfectly clean. I'm not saying it. I never got so many phone calls. The cleanest abortion you've ever seen. The women oh. are thanking me. Thank you, Donald, for solving my problem. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I think I think your I think your point uh, your your point is is valid. Um, People, I think that the, the cashing in that's going on, the revolving door, the paying, we haven't even talked about spreading the wealth around to families. We, oh, yeah. we briefly mentioned hiring families just now. Um, but all of these problems, I think collectively are eroding trust in our elected officials. Um, but it's not gonna stop us from voting for them because they're still better than the other guy, right? And so therefore nothing will change, nothing gets done. I mean, I have to tell you, Michael, this is a true story. Um, once you start writing a book like this, uh, it, it puts you in a weird position, right? Because six months ago, I was like, oh man, what if Congress actually banned stock trading before my book comes out? So now I'm like rooting against a policy <laughs> that I support. You're the swamp. <laughs> because I'm like, they, that'll ruin the book. And then I'm like, well, maybe, <laughs> Maybe then I'll get more, you know, more media. I, I, we'll just we'll, we'll push up the release of the book. Um, but then I was like, oh, I don't I have nothing to fear. They're never going to ban. <laughs> they're not going to ban stock trading. They're just <laughs> in the next six months, that they wanted to. It. Yeah, I like that. In the next six months, they're, they're, you're going to have a Republican House, Democratic Senate. Like <laughs> this is the issue we need to stop making yeah. ourselves rich for no reason. Yeah, I don't think. Well, that's it is. Concern. I mean, it is one of those things. It's bipartisan, right? Like sure. Josh Hawley wants to ban stock trading. AOC, even Nancy Pelosi now says that she yeah. wants to ban stock trading. Well, she didn't so, have time to get it done. <laughs> it just it never, never quite enough time, you know, because they're on vacation still. But let, let me talk. Let's talk a little about the benefits of corruption and of something that I'm positive you would agree with, which was when Barack Obama, President Obama had a supermajority in the Senate and the House and we're doing Obamacare, health care reform. Uh, they needed every single vote uh, in the Senate to have the cloture. Uh, they had a few swing votes in the House, which was a, took a lot of strong arming from Pelosi. Uh, she should get enormous credit because she, these congressmen knew they were going to get voted out. They walked the plank anyway. So the amount of discipline she instilled in her party is something amazing to behold, just on a pure strategic level. But Joe Lieberman, who was con a senator from Connecticut for many years, basically was in the pocket of some big insurance company. And he's like, F you, we're not doing socialized health care. And they wanted it and they were yelling at him. And he's like, yeah, no, what are you going to do about it? And thanks to Joe Lieberman and his corruption, uh, that uh, killed some kind of NHS system from being implemented here in the United States. So can't you make an argument there that this corruption basically saved a lot of lives? Because I'm sure you're, you would agree that socialized health care would have, talk about unintended consequences, would have enormous yeah. deleterious consequences. Well, I think it cuts both ways. I mean, it's philosophically neutral corruption. Sure, right. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, interestingly, Bill, there was a, a congressman named Billy Tozan, who was a Democrat from Louisiana, became a Republican, he helped George W. Bush push through Medicare Part D, and he immediately left and went to Big Pharma, yeah. where he lobbied on behalf of pushing Obamacare, but in a way that was conducive to you know capitalism and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and profits and all that. Um, so sometimes I think it redounds to the positive, you know, uh, or it just it's philosophically neutral. I will say what's interesting about this is. And by the way, I give a lot of credit to Peter, uh, Peter Schweitzer, uh, who um, a, a lot of my book that draws on some of his reporting that he has done, especially a book he wrote, I think, 10 or 12 years ago, um, around the time that we're talking about right now. Um, a lot of times insider trade, when, when members of Congress engage in insider trading, a lot of times they're just barely beating the S&P. Like they're, they're not wildly right. overperforming everybody else day in and day out. But insider trading is sort of like steroids. You know, when athletes take steroids, everybody thinks it's to make them 
stronger and bigger and hit farther home runs. And it does that, but that's not the main thing steroids do. The main thing they do is help you recover from an injury more quickly. That's the big benefit and the reason that athletes really will see a, a jump in performance. What insider trading does is generally it doesn't make a huge difference day in and day out. It'll help you perform a little better, but during times of big change and crisis, that is when they cash in. And right. so, for example, yeah. when Obamacare point, happened, yeah, yeah, the time of rapid change, that is when people betting all of a sudden they know it's going to go through. So they yeah. dump stock in this area, they buy stock in a different area and they cash in and they make a ton of money. It happened during COVID, right? Another yes. classic example, um, Senator Richard Burr, who was chair of the Intel Committee, Republican at the time, ever, before the average American realized how bad COVID was going to be, he dumped hundreds of thousands of dollars of his stock in things like Wyndham Hotels, things that were going to not fare well during a global pandemic. But the worst part is then he picks up the phone and he calls his brother-in-law. Within one minute of hanging up the phone with Richard Burr, his brother-in-law calls up his broker and dumps all of his stock. And so it's not that they made money, it's that they didn't lose money. Yeah, yeah. It prevented them from losing like hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of dollars. And that happened again uh, with even the Russian invasion. People were cashing in or you know, buying, you know, dumping certain stock, buying buying stock in you know weapons of war or whatever. Uh, so that's the real key. And I'm not sure how I got on this tangent, but no, but I think that's such a great point because it's, I, the, the, I didn't even think of this, but that's really excellent. The fact that all these uh, people who are investing in places like Halliburton and BlackRock and so on and so forth, assume I, I may, actually those might be private companies, but whatever the, the, the ones that are funding the war, you don't want, I don't think, I think pretty much everyone would listening to this would agree in uh, for politicians to be incentivized to prolong wars because these people are like i said soulless you probably have a better opinion of them than i do but i'm sure it's not a very high one the fact is people do conservatives do understand people respond to incentives so if there's a lot of incentives for them to have millions of dollars and there's a war over there with those people it's like listen if i get a, a, a nice mansion my kids are taken care of and some ukrainians die despite what they say in front of the cameras a lot of politicians are going to take that that mansion as opposed to do yep. the right thing and that's really where this gets very dark absolutely and like i said sometimes it redounds to the good and sometimes yeah. it redounds to the bad that would be a very bad bad thing and um we don't you know uh, by the way i should note this book is actually kind of funny uh believe it or not um i tried to write as as I was writing this, first of all, I was tapping our mutual friend, David Petruja. Oh my God, he's, he's the best. Brilliant and funny. He's feeding me ideas. One of my, you know, love him. And then I'm reading, like I was reading PJ O'Rourke intentionally as I'm writing this because it's a serious topic. Yes. And, and I do take it seriously, but I also wanted it to be light and fun. And so if you're listening and you're like, well, I was going to get this as a beach read, but this seems a little heavy. It actually is. I think it's written in a lighthearted way, but, it's a, but it is a serious topic. Matt, I assure you that none of my listeners ever hit the beach and they don't leave basements. <laughs> so there's no possibility of them being worried about a beach read. Folks, Michael Malis here, podcaster, author, and yes, underwear model. Sheath is something that I wear every day. And the great thing about sheath underwear is that they have dual pouch technology for both parts of your anatomy. They also have a girl's line. I don't wear that stuff. Dave Smith might. Go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE. You get 20% off. It's great underwear for when it's cold. It's great underwear for when it's hot. And I wear it every single day because it's the best underwear I've ever owned. The first time they brought into the studio, I was like, what is this? And now I swear by it. And in fact, I model for them. It's got added comfort, added performance, added mobility. And there's something a little subversive about talking to someone while the whole time your underwear is cupping your junk. I'm not going to lie. I do enjoy that aspect of it. And folks, they're not just an underwear line. Sheath now has bamboo hoodies and shirts, which are really, really soft. So go to sheathunderwear.com. Use promo code MALICE. You get 20% off your order. Support the underwear that supports you. 
and that supports the show. There's one thing I did want to talk to you about, and, and this is something that's a little kind of out of character for me, but since you're one of the very few people I feel that we could have a, 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 um, an honest bit of criticism uh, and you'd actually be receptive to hear what I have to say, I'm, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Something that really bothers me, uh, and I don't get into it really too much publicly because I, I feel like it would be talking to a wall, is when people, uh, um, and this is very common in the left, they'll invoke something horrible to kind of get over their, uh, it's a rhetorical device, to get over their views. A, a classic example of this is there's a big consensus that Holocaust denial is a taboo and a problem because this kind of slippery slope situation. But then they call, oh, it's climate denial. Well, no one's denying climate exists. No one's denying that the climate, you know, the weather, it doesn't change, so on and so forth. But you're invoking this term, which has a certain gravitas and cachet at the expense of millions of lives. And now you're doing it to get us to listen to Greta Thunberg to me, it's just really very, very low, right? Are, are you with me on that one so far? Yeah, yeah. And, and the one that's happening now, I mean, tell me if this is off base, but gender affirming care is, okay. I think. Yes, yes, that's right. Because right. who's against that, affirmation? That... Like, affirmation's yeah. great. Like, I'm in favor of affirmation. <laughs> but the, the, you use the term, and it's, it's like this, and it really bothers me a little bit. Um, this term, the big lie which was a Nazi term. It was a term coined by Hitler. It was used you know, to kind of uh, argue against Jewish power and influence. To kind of conflate that with Trump, first of all, I don't think Trump is lying when he talks about the 2020 election. I think he- But this is, it. I just want to be clear, this is not in my book, right? This, this is not in like, the book. It's an article you wrote for Daily Beast. Article, I was just okay. Googling about the book and the, you just re, you had used this term as well. And maybe I'm splitting hairs, but I just, I just wanted to hear your thoughts because I know sure. you're someone who's not going to have a knee-jerk uh, defensive reaction. I mean, to use- I think Trump believes he lost, he won the election. I think he genuinely believes this. So, to, and even if he's completely lying, to kind of have this equiv equivocation between his bullshit and Hitler, to me, is somewhat similar to that, and and I think is is just wrong. So, I'm curious, have yeah. you thought that through? Is that something that I have know, thought it through? I, I okay. have thought it through, and I'm I'm open to the possibility that I'm wrong. Number one, um, but. I have thought it through. So I'll give you my rationale, which you may or may not accept. Um, the, the first thing is that my understanding, at least, is that the concept of the big lie was that if you tell a, a lie that's really big, people yes. are more inclined to believe it. Right. right? That, so, that's something that's counterintuitive. People don't understand. Like in North Korea, it's yeah. like, how can they believe something ridiculous? It's a lot easier to believe something ridiculous because that's a, a testament of faith than it is to like something that's kind of a little bit tweaky and there's no incentive to anyway. Exactly. And so that's why I believe this is appropriate, because to say that with Trump, the audacity of Trump to say that the 2020 election was stolen, it strikes me as employing that that propaganda technique to tell the big lie that's so outrageous. Um, so to me, that's my substantive defense of it. OK. OK, now here's my admission against interest. The big lie is a good brand. Okay. Like if you're writing a tweet or even a column and you have to like literally write out, you know, yeah, yeah. election denial. But of yeah, course, yeah, yeah. You, I, you know, so it's a it's basically it's a short it's a cheap shorthand. So I have a substantive defense and a <laughs> sort of a PR gimmick defense. But I'm just I, I'm just curious. I, I don't understand this argument that it, I, I don't think it was stolen. I do think it was rigged in the sense that I think there was an asymmetry that the Democrats figured out how to work game the system better than the Republicans did within the rules. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, maybe you probably read the Hemingway's book on the subject called Rigged, and they talked about how, you know how certain um, funds were going to certain districts to encourage voting, getting uh, get the vote out, things like that, which are perfectly legal, but certainly are going to skew uh, uh, outcomes. And voting is, isn't a result of, who, of uh, how people vote. It's the result of who votes. Yes. It's about turnout. If I get my people and out- who and who counts the votes, but we won't go there. <laughs> but if I have 5% of the population, they're the ones who vote and I win, I still win. It's it's even though it's it's not you know representative of the total. And I'm not a fan of democracy anyway, so I don't really care one way or another. But I, I, I mean- like look at 1960. I mean, there, and look at Lyndon Johnson. You know, uh, he was called Landslide Lyndon because he very clearly stole yeah. his uh, Senate seat. So I'm I'm curious why you think it's so outrageous that the election would be kind of taken from him as opposed to uh, um, just incorrect. So I would say a couple things. One, 
when it came to the 2020 election, I, I wrote a piece in August of 2020 at the Daily Beast, which said, let me explain to you what's about to happen. Okay. Like, here's what's going to happen. Um, the first votes that are counted in most of these right. swing yeah, yeah. states are going to be election day votes. And Donald Trump will have won the election yes. day votes. And why is that? Because he told his voters, do not vote early. Do not vote by mail. <laughs> then later, when the mail the mail in votes are counted, because by law in some of these swing states, they cannot be counted until after election day. Uh, it's going to look weird. It's going to look fishy. It's going to look like Biden cheated. But in fact, it's perfectly rational. In fact, I'm telling you four months early that this is what's going to happen. And so basically, I think that um, Trump invited a lot of this yes. by virtue of discouraging mail-in voting and, and, and early voting. to your voting. point, there is now a kind of a admission, not that Trump could admit that he did anything wrong, but in Trump's circle, it's like now they're pushing it and being like, why do we tell people not to vote? This was a kind of unforced error. Yeah. And I also think that um, that there were courts, as you know, that uh, because of so because of COVID, um, there was a sense that that a bunch of people showing up at a at a ballot box and voting could be dangerous in terms of spreading the right. virus. Now, maybe that's true, and maybe it's not, or you know, maybe that's that might be compelling enough to to encourage mail in voting. Um, but I do believe, and I think it's pretty clear that there were certain states that decided we're going to do mail in voting. But the state legislature never approved that. That was approved by judges when in, constitutionally it should have been the state legislature. OK, so I think what would have had to have happened to stop that is immediately the Trump campaign should have filed an injunction, should have made the biggest PR stink in the world, should have brought every lawyer and that they could hire yeah. down on these states immediately and said no. According to your state constitution, the state legislature has to decide how elections are conducted. If they had done that, I would have actually been rooting for agreeing with them on principle. But they didn't do that. What they did is they encouraged their Trump encouraged his voters not to vote early, not to vote mail in. He then lost the election, I think, very clearly, fair and square. Well, fair and square by by the rules as as, as we're sort of laying them out and then claim that he actually won. So I don't know if that, does that make sense how, I've, no, I, that's I, how I, I view it? I understand everything you're saying. I just don't understand, I don't agree, and you're certainly entitled to your opinion, that that is outrageous uh, in terms of, uh, especially especially compared to many of his other statements. You know, he had, he's kind of a bombastic personality. He's not unique in this. Maybe he's unique in the style, but, you know, a, a good example of this uh, that you would, I certainly agree with. I remember vividly in 2016 when the Democratic Party was trying to stack the deck to make sure Hillary Clinton was the nominee. It was very clearly decided she's the nominee. We're going to drag you know her mummy carcass over the finish line and get her there. And they had debates because there was no incumbent at the time. Um, and they basically had like like a against the Super Bowl. And then it's like Christmas morning, and you know they just they try to have the debates clearly when there's the least visibility. And this is objectively the, the case. If you sat down and you said, "Where's the smallest audience?" That's when the Democrat debates were. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz went on TV, goes, "Oh no, no, we're having debates for maximum visibility because we're so supportive of our candidates." Like that to me is more of an outrageous lie, simply because I believe, and I, I, I'll just leave you with this question, that Trump really thinks he won. So to call it a lie as opposed to a delusion, I think, is a distinction. Mm. I guess maybe the difference. So I, I wish you know. there's a good analogy out there somewhere for me to explain uh, the difference. I do think it's worse to lie about having uh, won an election that you actually lost. And I oh, that's true. That's worse. Yeah, yeah, that's a bigger issue. Yes, than debates. You're right. Than a debate. Yes. Although you could argue that these little lies along the way are rigging the system and ultimately rigging an election, right? Sure. I mean, but but they're small incremental steps yes. along the way um, that are not dispositive in and of themselves. Uh, people could have still voted for Bernie if they wanted to. Right. 
Um, I guess to me, I would say, I think Trump knew he lost. Okay, that's Biden. the difference between us. That's the, okay. That's the difference. Yeah. So that's where we disagree. But here's where I will concede something. I think he may now believe. <laughs> I think <laughs> by now he may have talked himself into believing he won. Like he might be able to pass a lie detector today as believing that he won. I, I just, it's hard for me seeing what I know of his personality, either, neither of us, you know, know him intimately at all, that if he, with the rallies and so on and so forth, and, you know, he, you know, thinking of himself as kind of this second coming, and he, he had this massive 2016 victory against the biggest opposition I think anyone's ever faced as a, as a candidate, maybe George McClellan in 1864, uh, and it, he's fighting a corpse who had no respect in Washington. Uh, Joe Biden was never regarded as this kind of figure with gravitas. Maybe some foreign policy credentials. Who uh, Obama had him, but he was regarded as a joke. Even Obama spoke about it, how don't discount Joe's ability to fuck things up. That's an Obama quote. <laughs> And you having him because there was a quote during the campaign and Trump was like, you can't tell me I'm losing to Joe Biden. And I, yeah. I from his perspective, you know, you can and having the most votes of any candidate in history, Joe Biden. I mean, come on. It, it, it seems it, it seems very easy to me if I'm the sitting president that I cannot wrap my head around this even being a possibility, let alone a reality. So I guess we could just leave it there. Yeah, that's that that may fundamentally be where you and I differ is like, I, I think he knew he lost. But by now, I'm willing to believe he may have. Okay, no, may have I'm, just thinking, I'm just thinking about that Georgia phone call, and there's two ways of looking at it. Which is one is he's like, find me those votes, or you know, kind of in a mobster way, like figure it out. Or it's like, okay, someone's doing. It's like an accountant where you've got the spreadsheet. You go, something's not adding up here. I couldn't have lost to Joe Biden in Georgia. It makes no sense. So th there's two. Be, ways I would of also at say it. though, my, um, I don't have a lot of patience for delusional people either. Okay, like whether you're lying or delusional i think both would be disqualifiers to be president of the united states okay um qu quick prediction who is going to be the nominees of the respective parties man i hate to be boring but it's biden and trump i i would bet a significant amount of money it's going to be not one or the other just it's just in just in pure actuarial tables and Wait, I what, yeah they could that's the only way right is if one of them dies I think that's not necessarily. I think I think you can see a scenario where if Trump has a significant lead over Biden running into November, the Democrats pull him from the ticket. I'm thinking of that Senate candidate was Torcelli in New Jersey, where he was about to lose a yep. safe New Jersey seat. And they basically just took him off the ballot and put in uh, Frank Lautenberg in, uh, disregarding the law. And they won. So outrageous. That was one of them. I got to tell you, man, I remember when that happened. It must have been around 2002, maybe. Yeah. Um, that was one of the things that outraged me so much and utterly persuaded me that the Democratic Party is evil and corrupt and the, and and were they're the evil party were the stupid party that was the old saying. Can, can, I mean, you can easily see a scenario where it's August 2024, uh, and you know it's this it's it, it Biden's a sure loser, and they call him up. They go, Newsom's our guy, and uh, frankly, why wouldn't they? I would. Okay, but but. But based on that, I think Biden would have still been the nominee of your party, right? That is, this would happen after a, the convention is going to probably be. I, I'm in... talking about on the ballot, November 2024. Okay. So I, I I can very easily see, maybe this is my tinfoil hat talking as we speak on the wall behind those doors is Alex Jones's tinfoil hat on my wall. Um, but I, I I mean, because they did it with Super Tuesday. You know, they called uh, um, Buttigieg, they called Amy Klobuchar, they go, Biden's our guy, you're dropping out, because Bernie was leading in every single poll, I believe, except for one, on Super Tuesday, they're like, we're not having Bernie as a nominee, and they all got on a plane, and they're like, oh yeah, we love Biden, even though I think they were polling ahead of him, or had more delegates than him at the time, so, I mean, the power, I think the Democratic Party is clearly, and I just, I'll ask you that, much more organized, and yeah. much more of a machine, as Pelosi showed with Obamacare, than the Republicans are. Totally. It's another example of how things have changed, right? I just say the stupid yep. party and the evil party. The, the expression used to be uh, Democrats fall in love, Republicans fall in line. Yeah, It's the opposite now. Um, I think Republicans are really fell in love with Trump, but I think Democrats fall in line. I mean, they, oh, yeah. they salute, they, they've, follow authority. And, uh, you know, some of it, I think, is that Pelosi was just a very good authoritarian um, and very effective at what she did. But I think some of it is, for whatever reason, now there is a mentality in the Democratic Party that you 
get in line. And look at AOC. She's not raising a ruckus anymore. Thing, AOC I, I, basically I, endorsed Joe Biden. You're, 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 I, I was working on an MMA book and I met this fighter and the first thing out of his mouth was like, wow, you're just, you're just a little jerk, aren't you? And it's true. And the point I like to point out to conservatives is Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi have done a far better job of defeating and silencing Bernie Sanders and AOC than the Republican Party ever have or will. Uh, they are the ones who got them to sit down and shut the F up. You don't hear about the squad anymore. Uh, Bernie was completely marginalized and fell in line. This wasn't the work of DeSantis. This wasn't the work of Trump. This wasn't the work of Fox. This was clearly the work of Democratic Party who had a phone call and like, that's really cute little girl that you walked around and now you're in Congress, but now you're in my house and here's how it's going to be. And I think that, and that you, when's the last time you heard of Rashida Tlaib saying anything? Like she's completely vanished. And that's not because of, of Fox or Newsmax. Maybe they could tell us how to handle Marjorie Taylor Greene. I love her. I want her to be president. Like, I, there's, <laughs> like, I, I want to control the weather for real. Um, <laughs> uh, congratulations on the new book, Filthy Rich Politicians. It's out now. Matt, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Um, let me just kiss your ass a little bit. Um, uh, the whole thing. But, but I'll tell you why. Uh, it's because you and I probably don't agree on everything. I know we don't, but we had a conversation. I think we had a great conversation. Um, and I think we challenged each other's worldviews and like, this is what we need. Like, and by the way, this is why podcasting is superior to TV. Yes. You could never have this conversation on, certainly not on cable news. I don't think you could have it on any TV show. So that's why now I have my own YouTube channel. I have my own podcast. It is like a minuscule, uh, you know, listenership compared to what you've got. You're a modern but, day Tom Woods. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's the index card of allowable opinion, man, or whatever. <laughs> but I love podcasts. And so thank you for uh, for doing this. You are welcome. Have you ever heard that story that Napoleon used the Egyptian Sphinx for target practice and shot its nose off? Or maybe you've heard that a French astrologer named Nostradamus correctly predicted nearly 500 years of human history. Or maybe someone told you that the legendary blues guitarist Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads in Mississippi. These stories are what I like to call historical myths. Great little tales that may or may not have any basis in historical fact. On Our Fake History, we explore these historical myths and try to determine what's fact, what's fiction, and what is such a good story. It simply must be told. If you dig stories about death-obsessed emperors, lost civilizations, desperate sieges, voodoo black magic, and famous historical figures you thought you knew, then Our Fake History might just be your new favorite podcast. If you dig it, then subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts.